welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and so everybody else who has been here before, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is what we're here for. We're here for the entrepreneurs. We're here to build a community. And um, just a couple real quick notes. Uh, when we do the Q&A session, please stand up and grab the mic and um, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter. I, I don't think there's anything else I'm forgetting. We're good. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with our first presenters, a husband and wife team, very dynamic couple uh, at 417 DIY. Okay, I usually don't use a mic because I don't need one. Voice <laughs> tends to carry, but good morning, good morning. I'm Dina morning. Parsick. This is my husband, Steve Parsick. Morning. We own Boys and Toys Automotive. We also own Tax Diva Services. I'm assuming you realize who the Tax Diva is. <laughs> and our new venture is 417 DIY. And it is an unusual venture, a new concept, but it's a type of concept that makes you think outside the box, think outside of doing something totally, totally different that you wouldn't do. Now, I happen to know this lady right here on the front, and I doubt if she does her own oil change. No. There you go. <laughs> Just knew that. So we can teach you to do it in 30 minutes or less. <laughs> we can teach you to do it in 30 minutes or less. So we're going to start with telling you our business is the type that gives you the confidence and a word that was given to us this morning, empowerment, to say, I did it myself. I did it. Okay? And that's a feeling that mm, is a great feeling because lots of times we're pushed down and said, you can't do that. You can't do that. You know? But you can. And working on your own car, that's what this is about. So we're going to show you. We've had some great press for those of you that watch TV. We had a huge story on KY3. Very nice story done. Audrey came and did a very nice story on our new concept. So we'd like to show that to you. O'Reilly's and AutoZone sell parts from the do-it-yourselfer. Nobody gives the do-it-yourselfer place to do it at, and that's the gap I'd like to fill. It's one of the only places of its kind in this country where all, including amateurs and women, are encouraged to try their hand at doing it themselves. I get that when I get, they, I get done with their car and they turn a key, it's just a look on their face, you know, I fixed it. You know, and that's a lot of self-satisfaction. For owner Steve Parsick, this was a dream 20 years in the making, and his dream is bigger than just offering affordable auto repair. I like helping other people help themselves, and, and that's a big part of this. You know, not so much just uh, uh, helping them or doing something for them, it's helping them help themselves. Customer Craig Zeter helped himself. I saved $500. And now he's helping others for free. It's been off these having a lift right there. But this place isn't just about everything that's automotive, nor is it for just adults. They already have plans to hold classes to teach kids about woodworking, robotics, and metal craft. If we can keep them occupied and keep their minds focused in the good areas, they, they won't, they'll, they'll probably tend not to wander off into peer pressure and, you know, get involved in the wrong crowd. But for now, Steve's focus is on catering to this crowd. If you don't think you can't do it, think again, because you can. If you can turn a wrench, if you know what a wrench is, you can do it. For Soft Care BK News, I'm Audrey Easter. So there you go. That's 417 DIY. So Steve's going to give you some of the technical technical parts because I'm not a mechanic, I'm a tax person. We have 16 bays. Uh, we have power wash, steam cleaner, pressure washer. We have uh, all the tools you can possibly imagine. It's, it is set up and equipped as a professional automotive repair shop. 
Uh, we had, we we're in the process of putting a woodworking shop together and a metal fabrication area. We do have welders, we have plasma cutters. Um, we get a lot of people come in lately that have been uh, either bagging their trucks or uh, cutting out fender wells and things like that. Uh, we've had several women coming in doing oil changes. Um, in fact, one came in and did oil change and I convinced her she could actually do her brakes and she came in the following day and then brought her friend by the following day to do a CV axle. So uh, it's, it's, yes, it's, it's the, the feeling of I did it instead of I took it here and had it done, uh, to me is one of the greatest feelings a person can have. You know, I did this, I accomplished this. And, uh, and it, they it, saved a lot of money. Yeah, and they saved a lot of money, they really did. Uh, and, and, you know, to me, they knew, knew it was done right. We walked, if they need help, we can walk through them. Uh, through it with them. I have automotive programs, all that in Mitchell On Demand, which are very expensive programs that most people can't afford to have. Uh, same thing with the shop equipment. Most people don't have a lift in their home. And we have uh, nine of them. Yeah. <laughs> you don't lift your own car, okay? <laughs> Only our personnel, we put the car on the lift, we lift the car, we lock it, you can't move it <laughs> once it's locked. And if you need it locked out for some reason, you have to get one of our personnel to bring it down, okay? So you, they do not operate that type of equipment, okay? But they do get used to the lift. A uh, cool idea, but hey. you know, I grew up on a farm, so I spent my whole life trying not to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my question is uh, on liability insurance. So you already mentioned the lifts, which is a big issue. But from a financial point of view, 
do you have any idea ultimately of what your insurance costs are going to be as far as a percentage of gross? Well, as I said, my insurance man is in the audience here. Uh, it really wasn't as bad as most people would think. Um, it's because it's a new concept. I don't believe the insurance companies really have a, a, a code for it per se. Uh, they, they've kind of taken my garage keepers from my other shop, Boys and Toys Automotive, which I've had for 15 years now, and stirred it up a bit and uh, uh, came up with a policy for it. Now, the, a garage keeper's policy in general will cover, if, if I make a mistake on your car, it covers it. Well, now, I don't work on your car here. It's, it's a do-it-yourself place. So if you make a mistake, you're on your own there. Okay, so the policy isn't really as bad, like I say, as most people would think it is. Uh, Every person that comes in, they sign a waiver that was designed by lawyers and insurance people and everything like that, saying they are taking responsibility for their vehicle, okay, other than, you know, if they do something wrong to it, we're not responsible, you know. So that's the very, they don't even step foot, we don't even pull their car in till this waiver is signed, the shop rules, they go through the shop rules, and everything like that. I would think one of the biggest issues would be um, insurance around injury. That was, so is there, does your waiver cover that? Yes, I, okay. actually, uh, on, the, on the waiver itself, just a one-page waiver, and it does talk about the dangers of a shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, like, if a lift falls on somebody, it's definitely covered. If yeah. you cut your finger on your fan, well, shouldn't have stuck your finger where a moving part was. <laughs> we, uh, you know, we're, we're there to help you. Um, and, and I do warn people about the jewelry and things like that, not to wear it while they're working on there. We have a, one of our rules is no open-toed shoes. Uh, basically, it's safety things. We have safety glasses for people and earplugs if they need it. Uh, we supply that as well. The, um, we have gloves. Yeah, gloves if people want to use the gloves. Uh, and another thing is we, we check over your work when you're done. We like to look at it. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in torquing tires. Most people probably wouldn't even know what that is. But it is a specification that you use to tighten the lug nuts down at a certain poundage. And a lot of shops don't do that. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that because the tire won't fall off that way. Okay? Uh, so we, we do try and make sure that your vehicle, when you're finished with it, is as safe as it can possibly be. Uh, you know, we're we're going to try really hard not to let you roll out there and hurt yourself. And we're going to try really hard not to let you hurt yourself in the shop. So, you know, we are there, like I say, to assist people and things like that. Um, so far, so good. I, I think this is a great idea. I applaud you for doing this. Um, I used to do some of the simple things like oil change and everything until they started manufacturing the cars where you had to have rubber arms to get to things, and I gave it up. But my main question is, do you sell the parts? Like, if you show up and you don't know what you need, don't know... Um, what it is, do you just tell them where to go to get the parts, or do you have them there on, in your shop? Actually, uh, we partner up with AutoZone, which is within walking distance. O'Reilly's is with walking distance in the other direction, probably about a block and a half away from us. We're between both. Yeah, we're right between two of them. They will actually both deliver to us as well. Yeah, yeah they have no problem delivering. Uh, I have no problem helping you decipher what part you need so that you don't, well, hopefully you won't get the wrong part when they order them from AutoZone or O'Reilly's. But, uh, yeah, we, we have access to the parts. We do stock some oil and some filters there for people who just want to do oil changes, uh, things like that. Uh, as far as hard parts, I'm not really stocking them because we are so close to AutoZone and O'Reilly's. You know, we can generally have a part there within five to ten minutes. So are they counting on you guys to do the diagnostics on what's going on with the problem? Are you plugged into the computer and, and telling them what they need to fix? Them? Yes, I, on things like that that it has come in with a check engine light, my Pegasus scan tool is about $15,000. And most people would get very angry if I just handed it to them and said, here, go pull this in your car and figure it out. Because it, 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 it does take a lot of training and a lot of, some expertise to run it. So we plug it in, we'll give them a diagnosis of what it is. Uh, things people need to remember is that $15,000 tool doesn't tell you what's wrong with your car. It gives you a place to start with your car. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that that is the part that's bad. So that's, that's where automotive experts come in. And we say, okay, well, it says this, but we have found in the past that this causes that to do it. Uh, loose gas caps. Oh, my gosh, I can't tell you how many times a, a light will come on for a loose gas cap. Uh, and yet it says it comes up as an EVAP code saying you have a leak in your system. Well, of course you do because you have a loose gas cap. 
Yeah, Steve, I've got a 2001 Ford Focus that uh, sucked a valve due to the valve guide. I guess it's a pretty common problem. Mm -hmm. And I thought about taking that in and have it repaired, but I kind of wanted to teach my son a little bit about auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I was going to tackle that in my garage, and I really don't look forward into trying to do that in my garage. <laughs> do you, from your expertise, about how many hours would I need to have on your list to be able to pull that little 2.0, or whether I can do that, leaving it in the car or not, do you know? Yes, actually, uh, oh my gosh, when you ask time, for time, people ask me this all the time. It depends on how fast you are, I guess. Uh, slow, very <laughs> slow. <laughs> I would make a fortune if I got paid by the hour. We, uh, <laughs> yeah, That's what I'm hoping for. We, uh, we, uh, when you bring a car in, let's say you bring in a car with that difficulty, okay, you can't, you're a novice. You maybe can't do that in one day. Maybe you can't do that in four hours. And maybe you're so sick of it that you want to go, ah! Because I teach people, walk away, take a deep breath and walk away. So when you leave, if you have to leave your car there, it will stay inside. We do not charge you when you are not there physically working on your car. Okay, because we've had answer. some jobs that go over and they have to, you know, like we've had them come in and switch out transmissions. And you can't do that in a day unless you're, you know, but if you're, some guys could, okay, but others can't. So we, we take that into consideration. This is for the novice. This is for the person. I can't tell you how many fathers we've had come in. We just had one yesterday. And he said he made his son save up the money. It was going to be $250 that he had to save if he took it to a shop to do what cost him $75 at ours yesterday. And he did it himself. And let me tell you something. When that kid left there, oh, yeah, I can rule the world. And to answer your question, I'm, I'm assuming probably around 10 hours on that one. And that's not counting the machine work, because you're going to have to send it over to uh, Riley's machine or something like that to have the machine work done. Um, but yeah, probably, probably within 10 to 12 hours, you should be able to do something like that. And that's, that's a stretch of time. You know, um, I could probably do it in about six, so depending on, you know, not counting machine work again. I have a question about the name. If it's 417 DIY, if you're going to move to Tulsa or somewhere else, are you, are, how does that work with your branding? Or, you know, if, are you going to use their area code then? Or how I, are you I was use actually it? considering using the area code that they would be in. Because like 417 is Springfield. We all know that. Uh, and usually when you're in an area, uh, the area code represents the area that you're in. But the DIY is just a do-it-yourself center. So yeah, that's I was actually considering on the, on franchising that they would do the area well, code that they on that on that note. Why don't you expand on what you were considering on your franchise model? On the model, the franchise model. What do you think? He's wanting you to tell about the franchise. Oh, uh, well, I've had a lot of people on the East Coast and West Coast both ask me, uh, "How do we get one of these here? What do we have to do?" And I tell them, "Wait, just a little bit longer." <laughs> uh, we, like my wife said earlier, I've got an IT guy putting a program together just for this type of center, because there's nothing out there. I've looked, I've scoured. I, I even went so far as to look at uh, hairdressers because they rent uh, stall, stalls or chairs by the hour, and it just didn't quite fit this model. So I found an IT guy, and we sat down, and we've had lunch numerous occasions now, and he's very good. Uh, he's actually an instructor at Batterock College. So he's, he's been sitting down, and uh, we've been just banging our heads together coming up with what we need and how this model is going to be able to change and expand with the business. Uh, as far as franchising, uh, I'm hoping that anybody that is a franchise in something like this would stay close to, I mean, there's auto zones all over the country. There's O'Reilly's all over the country. And if they could stay within the, a perimeter of one of those, AutoZone, like I said, when, when I say AutoZone partnered up with us, unbelievably they partnered up with us. Uh, gave us discounts on the tools and equipment that were just unbelievable. The, uh, is membership wise, we're working on having membership annual, and if they go to AutoZone and they say, hey, show them their card that I'm a member of DIY, they actually get up to 20% discount on their parts, which is, you know, it's a substantial discount. And I truly feel that uh, that discount alone, depending on how much work they're doing on their vehicle, would more than pay for the, their membership fees. A part of this model also, okay, 
and Steve's whole thing was when he started as a mechanic he worked in the dirt and he worked in the concrete and he worked and he would have given anything to have a place that he could go and rent and lift that car up and get it done and get it going okay so one of our target markets is beginning mechanics okay and we rent them that bay by the month and they can bring in whoever's car they want to work on, whoever, their customers, okay? Because they're ours by renting that bay, okay? And then they move on to theirs, okay? I know one of the big questions that you're gonna, that's gonna be asked by these wonderful gentlemen that ask the great questions is, what do we want? How can you help us? Come use us, come fix your car, bring your son. Let us show you what we are. We're asking you, come tour our facility. Come see what we are all about. Because it is this amazing, amazing, it'll blow your mind. The pictures don't do it justice. Okay? Yes. How many staff do you currently have, and how many do you think that it will take to run your shop? Right now, another part of this whole puzzle is, in the beginning I told you we own Boys and Toys Automotive. That is a full-service automotive shop. Okay, with ASE, you know, they're there. You bring your vehicle into 417 and you can't fix it, and it's beyond the scope, we will tow it over to Boys and Toys where you will get it done for a discount and all that. So the two businesses are intertwined. Okay, that was the whole point of it. Right now we have, with Steve and I and the people we have there, there's five of us. Okay, we would like for there to be 11 or 12 of us because we're running around like chickens with our head cut off, okay? We're open 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. And this gentleman is there all those hours. And let me tell you something, I've learned more about mechanics than I ever dreamed in a million years. I keep saying, Let's, let me go back to taxes. Let me go back to taxes, okay? So, however, I have not attempted, I'll be honest with you, to use one of the lifts because they scare me to death, okay? And I'll tell the insurance guy, I haven't used a lift, okay? <laughs> And uh, however, though, I have made it a goal this week before it's over with to learn how to do an oil change because I want to be able to tell the women, I own this business. I'm a woman. Okay? We can do this. All right? We had two women in here yes in there yesterday. I make, if there's a woman in there, I make a point of going and say, hi there. This is who I am. I am so glad you're here. What else can we do for you? Okay, because I want women to understand they can do this. Paula Morehouse, oh my gosh, when she left, she said, you know what? When I left here after I did the oil change on your car, I thought I could rule the world. And I said, you know what, Paula, you can. Well, that's great. Uh, as always, we wrap up with the same question. How can we as a community help you? Okay, uh, like my wife said, come use our place, send your friends, things like that. Uh, we are looking for investors. Uh, to help us get up to this franchise state. Um, it does it cost quite a bit of money to get into a franchise area. Uh, time as well. Um, we honestly for... believe that this concept is sellable. I believe it with everything in me. Or I would not have invested every dime I had. Okay? I believe it is a need that needs to be filled in the economy that we live in. Okay? People can't, aff a lot of people cannot afford to pay boys and toys. They can't. Okay? We others, others can't afford to take their vehicle someplace and get ripped off time and time again. So we're filling a void. I believe it's a void that can be filled all over the country. And I believe there are people, like Steve said, we have gotten calls from the East Coast. How do we do this? How can we do this? And we're like, no, you know, because we'd like that franchise opportunity. We'd like to make the income off of it. And we'd like our investors to make the income off of it. I, again, thank you for letting us come. And I ask you, please come see our facility. Please come see what we are about. And I'm going to add one thing. You saw the little bit on the end there about the <coughs> maker's part. That's a totally different concept. That will be a not-for-profit, okay, totally away from there. But today... If you are driving down Chestnut Expressway, we are going to have between 30 and 50 homeschool children painting our building. So and long as it's not vulgar, offensive, and follows in the line of do-it-yourself, I'm allowing them 
I'm allowing them to take control of the canvas and just... So, yes. 1529 East Chestnut. It's right across the street from the school bus barn at the old uh, K uh, KCR Diamond, Diamond, Diamond International Building. So, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Steve and Diana. Very good. A um, couple of quick announcements. The MATA AITP golf tournament is this Friday. And I know Randy Baker's here and Sherry Coker's here. So if you ha have an interest in participating in that, we'll see one of those um, people. Again, that's this Friday at 8 a.m. to 12 noon at Island Green. Also, the Real Estate Investors Group meeting is June 19th. That is uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Pasta Express if you're interested in uh, what the Real Estate Investors Group are, is, uh, is doing. Our next presenter, we'll make sure he gets uh, mic'd up here, is uh, Samson Yee, and uh, he is with Panda Laundry, and Samson's originally from Los Angeles. He's got a real interesting uh, story for us. So are you guys ready to go? All right, Samson. Okay. All right, so uh, hello and good morning. My name is Samson, and I'm with the Panda Laundry Factory. And Panda Laundry is the next revolution of wash and fold. And for those of you who don't know what wash and fold is, it's any service that will do your laundry for you for a fee. Now, before, uh, oh, and on the One Million Cups website, Panda is described as the Ford assembly line for wash and fold. And before I can elaborate on what that means, I want to share with you the wash and fold hypothesis. So the wash and fold hypothesis states that most people hate doing their own laundry and would much rather have somebody else do it for them. So with this hypothesis, we can see that there's a latent, untapped market demand for laundry service. And anybody who can create a wash and fold business and meet that market need will make money. And as simple as that sounds, uh, there's a little bit more to it than that, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, so the holy grail for laundry operators is creating that uh, profitable wash and fold service. And going back to the earliest pioneering laundry operators, we can see that they try to capitalize on this wash and fold, this latent untapped market demand for laundry service by creating little windows and little counter areas. They put up big signs that say wash and fold. And these operators believed that these signs would attract the customers and they would make the money. But I would venture to say that for most of us in this room, we don't ever remember our parents utilizing a wash and fold service on a regular basis, if ever. Well, time would pass by, and a whole new generation of laundry operators would come in to the, to the industry. And they, too, believed in this immense potential for laundry service. And so beyond the little counters and the, and the little windows, they fully embraced the dot-com era, and they built websites. And so they believed the convenience of the websites will attract the customers and that they'll make that money. But I will assume to say that most of us in this room still do not use a wash and fold service. So we're here today fully in the mobile generation where it seeks to alleviate all the first world inconveniences with an app. And of course, somebody's going to create an app for laundry. And as you can see from this New York Magazine article, which came out just a few weeks ago, over a dozen laundry by app companies have entered this burgeoning marketplace in the last few years. And now we got tech guys who've discovered this latent, untapped market demand for laundry service. And they believe if they create a really cool app, people will use it and they'll make that money. But when we go back to the wash and fold hypothesis, beyond the fact that we know that most people hate doing their own laundry and would much rather have somebody else do it for them, there's a third key missing component that isn't addressed, and that is that most people will only use a wash and fold service on a regular basis if and only if it is truly faster, better, and cheaper than doing it yourself. So when we look at the uh, market laundry place today through the panda hypothesis, we can see why these companies will struggle to gain traction. None of these companies can do it faster. Minimum 24-hour turnaround time, if not 48 or 72 hours to get your laundry done. And no matter how much we hate doing laundry, we can begrudgingly do it faster than that. None of these companies can do it better. If we specifically look at the laundry by app marketplace, they utilize the marketplace business model, 
which means they take your laundry and then outsource, outsource it out to the lowest bidding laundry supplier. And that's not good news for you and your laundry. And also, with that marketplace business model, consistency, you cannot have consistency with your service quality. And as business operators, we understand better than anybody that consistency is the key to customer loyalty. And finally, none of these companies can do it cheaper. Uh, minimum double, if not triple, what you would spend to do the laundry yourself at a local laundromat. Panda solves all these issues because Panda is the Ford assembly line for wash and fold. And what that means is Panda utilizes a proprietary software to control each customer's laundry distinctly. The customer sets the wash parameters, and the system understands the preferences and sets the customer bins to the right modules at the right times. The system then can handle exponentially larger volumes of customer laundry and expedite it through the system at rapid speeds. So in a nutshell, what that means is you bring a, laundry to, you bring a load of laundry or even 100 loads of your personal laundry to a Panda location. You get it washed, dried, folded, packaged, and back to you in just two hours and for the same cost as doing it yourself at a local laundromat. Now, Panda will grow through a basic franchising model. We build a flagship prototype location here in Springfield. We operated for two years to prove the concept and show that we've tapped into this latent, previously untappable market demand for laundry service. We grow out to 100 franchise locations in five years. If each location does 2.5 million in gross revenue, which is 180 heads a day, Panda Corporate has a valuation of over 100 million. Then we go to P&G. Procter & Gamble has shown that they want to leverage their brands with a franchising model. And they've shown this because they've instituted their Future Works division, and they've actually created a wholly owned subsidiary called uh, Agile Pursuits Franchising, which owns the Tide Dry Cleaning franchises, of which one third is corporate owned. So in my opinion, a laundry factory is a better fit for P&G with their brands like Tide, Gain, Bounce, than a, than a dry cleaning establishment. So just as Henry Ford utilized assembly uh, efficiencies to revolutionize the auto industry, and just like McDonald's brothers used it to create the fast food sector, Panda plans to do the same for wash and fold. So I'm here today to network with as many Missouri bears who want to pan, uh, partner up with a Panda to help change the way Americans do laundry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Uh, louder. I'll just shout it. Um, what's your target audience? And how do you market? Uh, target audience is busy mothers as well as young professionals. But the B2B is where two thirds of our revenue is going to come from, I believe. So we go after colleges, we go after nursing homes. We go to a college and say basically, you, have to, you are competitive. You guys are competing with other colleges. Amenities count. Why don't you make laundry service something you provide, like a meal plan or room and board? We will front the cost, we will front the liability, we will have our cost, and whatever charge you put on top of that is your margin. And now you're a college that offers laundry service, which the students won't pay, the parents will. Because if you're paying 15,000 a year, <laughs> the average cost for a public university is 15,000 a year, a private university is 40,000. If you're paying that much money per year for your student's education, you don't want your daughter to go down to the laundromat in the middle of the night to do her laundry. And your son won't do his laundry until he comes home to visit on Thanksgiving, <laughs> and he'll bring it all with him. You need him to be focused, and you want it done. And Panda will provide that. I have, I have a question. I'm not sure what college kids are wearing these days, but I, when I went to college, they didn't really care what they wore anyway. Yeah. But my question is, how do you get it done so quickly? It takes me almost that much time. And if you have a whole bunch of different people coming at the same time, how is that Great. possible? You take the wash and fold process, which is done by hand right now. One person takes all steps, right? You break the whole entire process and break it down seven modules. So you break down every step from the dry sort, the wash, the repair, the clean, the clean sort, the hangs. You take it down to different modules. You automate the process for where each customer's bin is taken to each station automatically. And one person just stands at one station and they do one action. They just fold socks and underwear. One person just hangs shirts. One person just sorts the laundry. One person just feeds the washing machines. And you have a, basically a factory assembly line. And you can expedite more laundry that way than by doing it by hand. If you do it by hand, you got to remember each person's laundry's uh, bin, and you got to keep it separated and segregated. That takes time, space, and energy, and that's why you can't do 100 loads in one day. If you go to if you go to dry, if you go to wash and fold today, and there's 10 people that got in line ahead of you, you're not getting your clothes back tomorrow. And the other thing about using variegated wash and fold services is they all do it different. I mean, you, you use it one time and you get it back, and then you use it another time, it's completely different. 
Even if you don't like how your wife does your laundry, at least she does it the wrong way, the exact same way, each and every time. And that consistency is key to, to customer loyalty. So. Uh, on the technology side of things, um, you said you had a proprietary software. Is it integrated with the machines? How is it all as far as tracking? And I'm curious about the technology behind everything. Okay, so uh, the, the software uh, is the brain of the system. And it, it, we're looking to integrate it with the machine manufacturers. If we have access to an API, like for instance, we're talking to Continental uh, Manufacturing, and they, it, we're looking to get the API access to their machinery. That way, when the laundry shows up to the machine, the, the RFID technology will tell the machine which setting, which detergents, and whatnot. No operator has to push those buttons. But even if we do not get the API access right now, we can just still have a screen where the operator will touch the parameters because the information is going to be there. He will just actually transpose it. But we like to skip that step because it saves a step and it makes it more accurate. But I believe once we build the model, I believe manufacturers will die to give us API access. But right now, it's one of those things where why would they put their neck out and give you access to their motherboard and let you work with their, uh, their machines if they don't know what you're going to do with it? So it's kind of you got to prove your concept first. So. But I believe the market will be there. I'm concerned about the environment, more specifically the government regulations that will step into an industry like this if you're not environmentally friendly. Have you addressed those issues? If so, how? Well, I believe we will be environmentally friendly. Uh, first of all, we'd have uh, green technology. We'd use more energy efficient machines. We'd actually be more, um, what's the word? We use the right amount of detergents. A lot of people overuse detergents. We we'd, we'd, we'd train our customers in exactly how things should be done. And of course, our facility would uh, have the same kind of output as any industrial laundry facility, and we'd meet the same kind of qualifications that those facilities would, would need to meet when, in whatever jurisdiction. I think that, was that your question? Well, uh, your profit margins aren't real large. What if the government steps in and says, hey, we're going to tax you or fine you because you're not using environmentally friendly detergents? So he says that uh, if the government steps in to tax me or, or tax Panda because, let's say, we're not environmentally uh, responsible, at that point, I hire a lawyer. And we, and we go and we address that issue and we show that there's a latent market, market need and it has to happen and we'll figure a solution together. That's what I say. So. Yeah, um, do you do pickup and delivery or is this something where the customer has got to take it to you and then go back and pick it up from you? We don't do pickup and delivery. Pickup and delivery is where you lose your money. The laundry by app companies, their model is convenient. So since they don't do the laundry themselves, the way they're going to get your business is to go picking up your laundry. Washio uses ninjas. So it's really cool. They come and pick up your laundry, but that's where they lose all their money. What we want to do is build a storefront where people drop off their laundry. Eventually, will we have a pickup and drop off service? Yes. Will it be a standard feature of our, our business? No, because then we'd have to charge you more than it would cost for you to do it at a laundromat. And I believe there's enough people that will load their car and drop it off, go shopping, and come back in two hours. If I can do it cheaper, then they can do it at a laundromat. But if we try to deliver, there will be a certain people that will pay that premium. But as a business model, that's where we'd lose our money. First of all, very nice presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned that um, in your business plan, the first two years, you're going to focus on a, a company-owned store. And it seems like there's a lot um, that that um, hinges on that first two years. What made you choose Springfield, Missouri to launch that first two years? I really believe that Springfield is the ideal location. Uh, if you go to San Francisco, you're not going to have a real representative market. There are a lot of people with expendable income in San Francisco that will pay for anything. Like literally in San Francisco, they have business models where they'll deliver cookies to you. And that's not representative of the United, United States. If you can go to a moral a more mix between a big city and a small community, and you can find that ideal place, which is Springfield, I believe you can prove your market there. And if you could prove it there, I believe it will work anywhere. And that's something I believe in Springfield. Samson, as a follow-up to that, um, can you tell us a little bit about how it, this got started and where you came up with the idea and uh, what your background is? OK. So I was born and raised in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I came out here to run our family's motel. and. Um, so I was running the motel, and I noticed that our, our washers stopped running after the housekeepers left. And because these washers are big commercial-grade washers and dryers, and I had staff overnight that I need to keep busy, so I said, I got to do something with this. So I decided to create a laundry service. And so I approached two colleges, Baptist Bible College and Evangel, and I asked them to let me allow to set up a little booth. And I set up a little booth there, and I sold laundry service to college students. 
And what I found was I had to cap my number at 25 students per, per campus because I couldn't physically handle more than 50 customers a weekend because we'd process it all together. And it got to be overwhelming. So I said, well, what if I want to get that whole college and take care of their entire student body? There's no way to do it with the systems that are in place today. We need to automate this bad boy. And that's where the, that's where the idea started from. So this question was kind of inspired by Chris Allen on Twitter, where he said, Panda Laundry, will you turn my whites pink? What kind of insurance do you have to cover if you ruin a man's white polo and you turn it pink? Like, do you cover that entire cost of the polo? And how much do you think that you're going to totally need in insurance coverage? The cost of insurance coverage, I'm not exactly sure in terms of dollar amounts. But of course, we'd cover their clothes. Because if it costs us more money to replace their clothes than what we made from them, that's what we have to do. Because it's about customer service. The only way this company is going to work is if they trust bringing us their clothes. And the system is going to be designed so that that kind of discrete um, mishaps won't happen. It'll be designed into the system with fail safes and kind of checkpoints to make sure it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, we will cover it. Because we have to. And if we have to lose money on it, we will. But the better the system becomes, the less it'll happen. That's sort of the idea. How do you batch all your clothes so you don't get clothes mixed up? The sorter. The first module is the sort station, the wet sort. And that's pretty much the, the, the brain of the modules. And they get trained. They understand fabric types, color fastness, what gets mixed, what doesn't. Also, the customer. The customer sets the wash parameters so that when we come in and get their load, their information comes up. And we just sort by types and fabrics. But they set the wash uh, parameters for it already. The ones that don't take the extra step to put the wash parameters in, we just have an automatic Panda system that goes through and does it uh, efficiently and wonderfully. Are you using RFID technology yes. in the clothes? Tracks Track it through the elaborate whole system. on that to the audience? OK, so the RFID is just readable, writable barcodes. So that way, when we put each customer's clothes in a particular bin, we know whose it is and where it is and what's going to happen to it next. Then, then the bin communicates with the system and knows where to go next and where to come from and what to do. Uh, throughout the whole system. And then that basically, that, the software is the, the brain that coordinates for the 100 plus 200, 300, whatever amount of customers in the system. We can all do it, but we couldn't do it for 100 people at a time. So the software will do it for us. How many employees? OK. If we're fully at full volume and running at full steam, 12 to 18, we are a margin-based business. It's kind of like a McDonald's model. Sometimes you go to McDonald's, and I see 12 people behind the counter, and I only buy a dollar burger. But the, at, at the end of the day, they have 1,200 to 1,500 transactions at $4.50 a pop, and sort of the same kind of idea. We will staff lean and st staff heavy. We'll know certain days. And the thing about this is there's no rush laundry, like a lunch or a dinner. So we can accommodate for contract accounts, process it overnight or during off-peak hours. I believe we'll have more control over our controllables than, let's say, a restaurant. And you had mentioned about being cheaper on price. Is it per load, or do you like offer monthly service, you know, like kind of subscription fees and so forth on that? OK, so uh, we want to we wanna try to gear toward going per, per load, uh, not per load, but per crate. And uh, that gives us the, the, the best margins. But let's say a mother with three kids who's going to use the service, let's say, 10 times, like say 20 loads a week or something like that. I do want to experiment with membership pricing with a cap, like a like almost like a cell phone plan with a limited amount of uh, uh, minutes per month. So if you come under, it rolls over. If it goes over, it's going to be at a nominal uh, per load over. But it incentivizes the mothers to use our service because they get a per load rate that is cheaper than if they paid uh, per crate. But, um, but I think it's going to be a mix of both. But really, we want to go per crate because that's where our margins are. Start shirts in two hours? We don't start your shirts. We'll send it through a steam tunnel, and it'll come out steamed but not physically pressed. You can pay for play, request a steam, and we'll pull it out of the system, get it steamed, and get it to you. Samson, I got a question for you. You told me the other day in your um, ask for investment, you have this very thought out. Um, most of the entrepreneurs that come through One Million Cups at this stage that have not launched haven't put this much thought into it. You mentioned that you won't plan on buying a, a building in real estate and building it all from the ground up. Um, as someone mentioned before, a lot of this success is going to be uh, dependent on the first model. Uh, 
why do you feel it's critical to invest that type of capital in uh, a building instead of leasing? Instead of leasing? Yeah. Because of the fact that the prototype pendant location is a uh, weird layout. It's 3,500 square foot with a second story, and you're not going to find that space. Plus, you're selling the vision and you're selling the brand. Just like when Ray Kroc built a prototype McDonald's design when he, when he started franchising from the McDonald brothers, he was selling the vision. So he had to show them a facility. The system will work, but I have to show them a location. I have to show them something that they're going to go to. What is Panda Factory? What, it's going to be a transparent laundry factory. Basically, just like you go, to, you, just go, you go to Krispy Kremes and you can see the donut machine making the donuts, kind of the same thing. You come in and you see the whole f facility operating. You understand what's happening with your clothes, and you get it. It's automated. Um, and I believe the build-out is key because we want a franchise, and you have to have a franchisable template. And uh, 2.5 million is what, what we would need, but that's the purchase of land, and that's a two-year runway. So that'll, that's me believing that there's a latent, untapped market demand for laundry service, that if we can deliver laundry service with this kind of accuracy, consistency, and for a low price, just there's a belief that the people will come. So. Let's say I know somebody who spent way too much on their jeans, okay. just theoretically, yeah. and um, is really picky, <laughs> and is really, really picky about how they get done because it's a car payment to replace them. Yes. Um, this, this person's an idiot. Um, so let's say he has some shirts like that too. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how well you can customize that process for me? Um, because I'm bringing you, or whoever this is, is bringing you a very um, specific, you know, they, they're bringing you a load of clothes they want done very specifically. Okay, currently in our app, uh, we, we're going to implement what we call Panda Tags, and you can tag specific buckle jeans or whatever the, back then it was diesel for me, but uh, buckle jeans, and then you could give us specific wash instructions. Let's say you only want half a of soap and you want it air dried. Well, you put the tag on it, and we, know, we identify it at the sort stage, and it goes through that process separate, ideally, specifically the way you want it. Now, beyond that, we use tags. And these are just going to be RFID stickers that are, you pull them off, put them on, stick, stick them on the clothes. Eventually, though, we want to go to RFID chips for the clothes individually. One, first of all, the government's not going to track you. So someone's going to say to me, they're going to track me. They're not going to track you. But two, right now they make RFID chips that are about the, sa the size of a grain of rice. And it's readable, writable, and it holds information. But they don't make them right now that are washable and dryable. They can and they will. Once they do that, I can embed every single item of, every single item of laundry that comes through my system. And you'll be able to discreetly tell me which red shirt you want, what done, and I'll be able to find it with that RFID chip. Also, let's say you have a camel top, camel shorts, and camel socks that you always wear when you go hunting. And you always want, you want it packaged together. You don't want your, cam your shirt here, your pants here, your socks here. You can just give me that information. I find it with the RFID technology, and I package it together. So basically, it gives you that kind of discrete control, because the system will take care of everything, and the humans just implement the system. So, so. <laughs> and real quick, real quick with, the, with the RFID technology, and it will be there. And once the system is put in place, it will work. Let's say you come in with three daughters, one six, one five, one four, but they all have separate clothes. The sorters won't know that, but when you RFID it, we'll know who's Betty's, who's Brittany's, and who's Susie's, and it can get packaged separately. Samson, so what's next uh, as far as the business plan goes and getting this to market and launching your first store? The, the next steps are to, for me to try to get into 100 meetings. If I can network with as many people who would like to talk to somebody about a laundry idea so that I can go and discuss the pros and cons, introduce my team, and uh, show the potential, though that's what I believe I'll be doing for the next six months to a year. But if we can meet enough people who can believe in the vision of changing the way Americans do laundry, I believe we can. So, I mean, it's a, it's a need. It's been there forever. I've told you, early laundromat operators have been trying to do this, and they're, they're just model is broken. We just need to fix it. And so is there anybody doing anything remotely like this at all? The laundry by app companies, the, the closest thing to it is that they're trying to scale. And they're scaling through a marketplace model. It's kind of like Uber, but for laundry. But the, the reason why it doesn't work is it's your laundry. You don't want it done differently each time. You want it the same way, and you want it consistent. That's why the model won't scale. However, Washio just closed a Series A at 10.5 million. So it sh that, to me, shows that there's a latent market demand for laundry service we need to address. And I wish Washu the best of luck, because Washu would be a perfect partner for us. And you'll say, why? Because they're the ones expensing all that money going after building the, 
the customer base, taking care of the customers, going and getting them, but they'll need a back-end service provider, which we can come in and take care of for them in the beginning. Okay, so location is gonna be important as well because someone's not gonna to wanna to drive 30 minutes to drop their clothes off and then go back and get them. And so are you going to have a factory somewhere and then some drop-off locations? Is that kind of the model? But, or no, are you the, going to have the, multiple fact, I mean, because I- So each location is the factory. So it's a 3,500 square foot design with two stories, 7,000 square feet of facility, which will be able to turn over 2,000 pounds of laundry. The reason why it's 3,500 square feet and not just 7,000 square feet on one floor is because we want to fit it into every pad site. Everywhere you see a McDonald's, everywhere you see a Wendy's that's anchoring a shopping center, that's where you want to be. So if it's 30 miles away, uh, we're just going to have to convince a franchisee to build one in that area. It's just like a McDonald's. So what, what we're looking, what we believe is going to happen is the wife or the, or the husband will take the laundry, drop it off at Panda, go to Walmart, do their shopping, grab the subway, pick up their laundry and go home. So that's sort of what the, the design of the facility is, to, to do all the laundry in-house. A lot of, we all talk about growth. Is there any way to scale down to accommodate smaller communities where you don't think that you could get the break even of 180 loads a day? 180 is not break even. 180 is what will make 2.5 million at the end of the year. Okay. okay. And one, 180 customer heads, what, what does that mean? McDonald's does 1,200 to 1,500 transactions a day. If you can picture about 10% of the people that would normally go to McDonald's would use a service like this, that's the number. And if you hit that, that's 2.5 million a year. 100 locations, that's 100 million evaluation. That's what we go to Procter & Gamble for. But uh, yes, I, absolutely, the, the, the technology is scalable. So what I would love to do is I would love not to capital expenditure every single location that comes out. Let the franchisees do that. And let's also license this technology to every college in the country. I don't want to build a laundry facility for every college. I want them to license that technology from me. Because we already got the systems in place. They could build it for their 20,000 student body or their 60,000 student body. They'll expense it out, but they'll pay us a licensing fee. Talk about your hard costs, like for machinery. I'm right over here. Um, when you start out, what's it going to cost you? And have you looked at any alternative funding sources, like either grants, government, SBA, anything like that? I actually just pulled an SBA loan, and it took two years. So I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's a tough process. I have not looked into other processes in terms of funding yet. I've just believed I'll meet somebody who just believes in the vision, and they will walk with me. That's what I believe, but eventually I uh, will explore other options once I, I think I get to that point. In terms of hard costs, the actual, the, the laundry equipment is about a quarter million to 300,000. The automation is about 400,000. The software is already going to be in place. So each physical facility is going to be about uh, um, 1.75 to 2 million to build out. But let me tell you how that number is not going to scare you. Uh, Sky Zone, which is an indoor trampoline park, okay, they've just franchised 200 plus locations in the last two years. They are a 60,000 buy in, 6%, and a $2 million build out, and they've sold 200 franchises. So if you can sell, indoor trampoline parks at a $2 million build out, I believe we can sell 100 franchises over five years at the same build out, but with, I believe, better margins. Well, I don't know their margins. I think they, I don't know. What, what, what viable business, that's what I meant to say. Samson, we always wrap up with, okay. how can we as a community help you? Introductions. <coughs> I just need to meet as many people as you think may want to hear me talk about laundry. And I, and I believe somebody will get the passion and understand that this is a market need that is there and we can address it. We've been trying for many generations, but nobody has implemented the strategies the way Henry Ford did, the way McDonald's brothers did. Because remember, when you think about McDonald's, I mean, they didn't make a better burger. They just got it to you faster and cheaper. But that changed the way we ate, so. Thank you, Thank you. That went a lot better than I thought it Well, that wraps it up for today. Um, Samson got me really excited. I, I think that energy is, is what we need here. Uh, pushing the envelope, asking for a lot, uh, that's really what this is all about. And uh, believe it or not, we're going to be here next week. Same place, same time. We'll have two more presenters. Uh, check us out on Facebook, all that stuff, if you need to get our updates. But we will be here. Thanks for coming out.